<laughs> so VJ, is something unplugged? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Mel right. is so mad. You got dude. Can you can you can you turn off that fan? <laughs> <laughs> I should just leave like three minutes of this in. It. You're listening to the Spy Fi After Dark podcast. All right, we are here with the inaugural episode of Spy Fi After Dark. I could not be more excited to introduce my two friends, two very good friends for this episode. Uh, my name is Millen, by the way. This is Frank. I'm Frank. And Alex. All right. So these guys are pretty funny and they're very knowledgeable about Marvel, particularly Frank. Uh, Thank you. So I figured I'd just open this up with a question. Just get us into this. Uh, and, and Alex, I uh, apologize in advance for this question because you haven't seen it. Far from home, Far from home. or homecoming. <laughs> Which one do you like more and why? Are you asking me or Alex? I'm asking you because Alex hasn't seen Far From Home. <laughs> he can make up something. Um <laughs> <laughs> He is good at that, but <laughs> I'm gonna say it's a little early. <laughs> I think I enjoyed Homecoming more. Okay. Mysterio really got me though. Like the villain was really cool. Yeah. Okay. I I actually think Far From Home is better. Okay. Is but they're both sponsored by Sony, by the way. Yeah. Is well, it? I wish. Jesus okay. Christ. <laughs> okay. I take that hundred thousand dollar check any day. Ooh. Um, Church. <laughs> uh, no, I mean I like both the movies a lot. They're at the top of my MCU list. Oh. Okay. But Far From Home for me just barely edges out Homecoming. Why? Why is it? It just feels like a more dynamic movie and somehow they still managed to get the origin story type vibes that you get from a typical orange sto- origin story without actually being an origin story. Are we talking about Mysterio in particular? No, I'm talking about the uh, path that Peter goes through. Cause he like, he went, he goes through an origin story path in homecoming, obviously. Definitely. Uh, but I think he's still, they still managed to do that again. With this one, because now he's going from your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man to a person who's potentially going to replace Iron Man. Yeah. Right? Or at least that's the pressure on his back. He may not actually do it, but that's the question posed to him, and he has to go through that journey of deciding what he's going to do with that. True. Which to me is very similar to an origin story. Okay. I mean, if you ask me, he kind of regressed because, you know, going from going from a, what is it, a Homecoming to Infinity War, which is of like reality altering proportions and then and then the end game and then dialing it back to far from home like i guess i guess you're right in a way like they saw his potential in those movies and they're like oh you can take over but he's like yo i'm a child Mm -hmm. i haven't seen it but i'm i'm gonna just call out that millen's perspective on this far from home movie makes sense because to your point in between homecoming and far from home you have movies of grand scale like endgame and infinity war and they dialed it back and kept the continuity of character development without like expanding the scope too much i'm assuming so it's almost like far from home maintained that origin slash small scope like esque aspect of homecoming i'm assuming that's why millen so i think what millen's saying is you've got a movie you've got a developed character you've got more things happening but at the same time it's just an extension of a story that's still under development versus like a forceful aggregation of everything else that's marvel I think that's what he's, what he's, I mean, I could be wrong here, but that's what I'm assuming he's appreciating about it. So it makes it still very, very Peter esque. You're talking about the movie as a whole or just like Peter as a character? I mean, particularly, I'm talking about Peter as a character, but the movie as a whole, I still, I like it a little bit more. But like I said, it's just, it's just a little bit. This just ekes out. You know, it's not, not like a wide gap here. Okay. I mean, 
my opinion can be swayed, but uh, I think most people, including myself, I mean, Mysterio was more fun to watch, like just to see him do his thing. Mm-hmm. But in the quiet moments, I preferred Vulture, Michael Keaton's Vulture. Well, I think Vulture was really cool as a villain because he was really tight with the story. Mm-hmm. Like there wasn't a lot of, um, like it all circled back to the personal story. True. So it all sort of tied into the same thing, which is really cool and really satisfying when you see that turn at the third act and you're like, oh shit, he's her dad. You know, that moment is really great. Mm. I don't think there was quite the same moment with this. I mean, obviously you have the turn of Mysterio at the midpoint, but it's not, it's not the same. It doesn't hit the same. same. Uh, I have a hard time deciding which villain I actually like more. I kind of like Mysterio more in that he's more of a challenge. You know, he's clearly got more going on and I think he's actually a better foil to Peter. Okay. Than Vulture. Explain. Whereas Vulture is like a very different character with a very different set of, goals and, and very different set of skills i haven't seen the movie but i might just make an assumption um with homecoming you can't really take holland spider-man seriously as an adult so like even though you have such a potentially deep dynamic between keaton and holland in a sense that there's a triangle it's not real okay. because there's like an attraction i forgot her name Liz Allen. is that her name yeah, so uh, Thank you. The, exactly. yeah, the, yeah, the, the, right. the attraction between the two characters is there, right? And then you have like the protective father. And it's a very, very interesting setup. And, you know, to your point, it's a full circle when that, when they reveal um, the association. And, and then we move on to Keaton Vulture, like realizing who Spider Man is and all that. It's, it's fantastic. But it's also stifled just by the fact, in my opinion, that. Peter Parker is younger. And also there aren't a lot of established layers and depth to him. So obviously like a character being, you know, 14, 15 years old has some kind of emotional limitation. Um, but after movies like Inf- infinity war Endgame, potentially regardless of age, you could create said emotional dimensions to a character like after something like that. Yeah. Right. So, like plenty to go off of. What I'm trying to explain is like Homecoming was limited because even if you create a villain that has like some deep seated vendetta against a character like Holland's Spider Man, I can't take it seriously. Mm-hmm. You can't. The movie was very, very well done for what it had because it started fresh again. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know what I'm saying? And and we have a very, very young hero. Um, and they introduced mature concepts that were imbued in vulture's character vulture actually in my opinion had more dimension than anyone else in the movie right True. in my opinion but mm. it's because the movie is simple to me the movie was more simplistic and fun in nature than what i think far from home maybe i haven't seen it but i feel like the chances are there, there will be deeper character dynamics because he is in a more mature place and whether or not this takes place before or after things like infinity war or Endgame, technically still can't rule them out because as an audience, you have a different perspective of Peter Parker. Even if even if it's not chronologically. I don't remember like where Far From Home falls, but you look at his character differently. I think it's months after Endgame. It's like it's less than that. It's like sure? it's very soon after. Right I'm after thinking eight to nine months. I don't know. Stark's. Don't know I'm long. assuming Stark's death is still fresh. Yeah. In that movie. No, it's it's like at most a month later. You think so? Yeah. Because you know, originally when they were talking about it, they were saying it was literally going to start off immediately after. Endgame. Okay. I don't think it was immediately after Endgame, but I don't think it was very very long. They so, they might have had like a scene in their heads that they were writing initially that they cut out. That was right after maybe. Okay. Which is Assu- why they said that, but yeah, assuming it was even ha- half a year or less. And what I'm saying is, even if it didn't take place after Infinity, I'm, I'm making the case, even if it didn't take place after the movies like Infinity War and Endgame, this movie allows the audience to have a richer experience 
regarding character dynamics because of Endgame and Infinity War. Yes. The like, kid is 14, 15 years old. There's not really much you can you can do. You're saying the very nature of Infinity War and Endgame is going to allow like any character to be more than they were before end. Yeah, gener- generally with, with... And I'm making kind of an assumption, like a pretty big assumption here, but generally when you have kids that are... Uh, when you have characters that are that are younger, usually a, a parent esque dynamic and conflicts tied to that parent obstacle or like that parent son or parent daughter kind of dynamic is usually like the go to, and that wasn't really a thing to a great degree in Homecoming. Um, I really like the friendship aspect, just the 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 coming of age, but like that's a coming of age asterisk kind of understanding because again peter like filled shoes but filled shoes in the context of being like a 15 year old in a specific situation do you understand what i'm saying so it's mm-hmm. like it's just a limited movie like it was a lot of fun to watch i love it but like i was focused on keaton maybe because i'm an older person now so there's more relatability to like that kind of character and like his mission where it came from like why he became like jaded why he acts the way he does you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying then if I were to go watch Far From Home, like there's so much now that we have to under, like you just have more to work with with a character like Peter. And well, then if he has a dynamic or a vendetta or a conflict with someone else, you can actually like deep dive into that said conflict. Well, I would say that Keaton's villain was more multidimensional in what we saw, but I think Mysterio had so much more under the surface that we didn't actually see true but that's a testament to homecoming versus far from home vulture is a probably considered a better character that's that's fair that's fair because like you know mysterio was he was angry like he said a lot to people but there must be more to, to what's going on to, uh, for him because like there's a lot we didn't see or we didn't talk about i mean we knew he was petty we knew he wanted like a revenge or something but you know is there more to it did he it seems like he wanted to prove a point. Mm-hmm. And a lot you know, of Vulture, Vulture was just a father trying to feed his kids. And a big aspect of that too mm-hmm. is like what Peter has to do in the context of what has been going on that'll make the movie interesting. So what I'm trying to say is like in Homecoming, you find out that like this girl you like and you're 15, right? This girl you, and you're, yeah, you're living his life. There's a girl you like at, you know, in school and her father is like, this villain there isn't much conflict there i don't understand like the dimension to that you know what he's going to do you know what he has to do Mm -hmm. he knows what he has in fact in fact like usually when you have a situation like this your love interest is like at stake actually she's not she's not (laughs) your 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 love interest or no your love dynamic is preserved so like now what right Plus he's 15 and like more powerful than everyone around him. So it's just, it's just a different movie, but like I haven't seen far from home, but I can imagine that Peter's reaction to someone like that character stereo, right? It's going to be insane because there's more at stake potentially. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So, but again, like I loved far from home or excuse me, uh, homecoming, but um, I just liked it because I thought they did a great job with, um, the villain and the supporting characters. Yeah, I, no, I really, I really emphasize awesome. the supporting characters. But again, like the you know, and actually, I think one of the things Far From Home does really well is expands on the supporting characters. Definitely, yeah. The, well, the thing with, for me with Mysterio is he's more of a foil to Peter in the sense that they're both very smart. They mm-hmm. both have a lot of like similar characteristics, but mm-hmm. have clearly gone on divergent paths. So I. I see more parallels between them versus uh, Vulture is more of like a challenge to him, like a challenge of like you need to enter adulthood almost. You it's know? just it rise to occasion. It's, it's, it's a catalyst it's liter- to rise to occasion. That's all it is. Yeah, like you said, it's That's literally like it adult versus child versus this is in Far From Home. It's almost like child versus child. And that's more interesting in my yeah. opinion because there's more relatability between them. That that, But I haven't seen this film. What do you think? Frank. Mm, no, that's what you guys have to say. Uh, I think I get the foil thing, what you're talking about with Mysterio, because like you said, he's brilliant. <clears throat> Peter's brilliant. Um, uh, P- 
Peter is at a point in his life where he's trying to, you know, be more, but still be a kid. Uh, and people see his potential and he can go whichever way he wants. Uh, the Mysterio or Quentin, he's already been there and he's been used because of it. So he's jaded. He's the jaded Peter. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's, um, I guess there's truth to what you said. I don't know. I'm just thinking about that. It kind of makes sense. I mean, I also just generally like the whole friend becomes villain dynamic. Okay. In general, that's just personal preference. Mm -hmm. Like I like that, that midpoint turn. Oh, it was, yeah, I agree. But a part of me, and I was talking to Alex about this before we uh, signed on. I almost, while I already knew who Mysterio was, what he was going to do. Oh, I didn't also really so going into it like i have no comic book knowledge i had seen a trailer and i i saw him in the trailer but i actually didn't know what was going to happen i really had no idea mr for all intents and purposes is a hater yeah (laughs) so he i um, I know that now obviously yes he you know he's a special effect artist and this this and that but like i would a part of me wanted him to like be telling the truth to like, I was like, is he telling the truth? Because he seems really cool. But the bigger part of me, I'm like, yeah. When's he going to turn? What's he going to do? Uh, more how he's going to do it. I already yeah. knew what he was going to do. I, yeah, I guess. So if you're anticipating it, it doesn't have the same impact. He, he's coming from a very, very different perspective watching the That's movie. fair. That's really And fair. it's another thing where like Frank has quite a bit of content to compare this movie you know, against. Mm-hmm. So he has expectations. He has a deeper understanding of the character than you may have had going in, for better or worse. Yeah. For That's better true. or worse. Yeah. So it's because nice. because I get to come in with fresh, complete surprise. Like yeah. I get to come in with a completely fresh experience. Yeah, I'm wondering how they're going to do Mysterio. I'm, you're wondering what's up with Mysterio at all. Exactly. So yeah. So I think for in that sense, that's true. That then it could come off better for me on the mm-hmm. first watch. Yep. And on that note, like a very good question oftentimes to ask is how do you rate a movie that's tied to an existing franchise? Because you can always say this movie is good for a blank movie, meaning this is a good movie. This is not a good That's very hard for people it's like so, me. So it's so difficult. It's, like you could say, Oh, the last couple of Star Wars movies were excellent films, but not good star wars films and like well, that's a very very deep well my my strategy is just to never read the source material <laughs> it's a it's a it's a high risk high reward kind yeah. of thing um you, i i do agree with you that you may generally be more disappointed than not but that's true because i am going to have certain biases that you aren't mm-hmm. going into it Right. But at the same time, there's certain things about the movie, for better or for worse, that I'm going to like take in stride or love regardless. See, people like me, like just seeing Mysterio on screen is ridiculous. Yeah. We never thought we'd see Mysterio. Yeah, there's a satisfaction of yeah. just getting something to actually come true. It's yeah. high risk. So yeah. high reward. That's fair. That's what it is. I mean, that's kind of like what makes the MCU special in general. Even mm-hmm. if you haven't read any of the comics, as you get more into it, seeing the crossover elements, seeing things like connect together is so satisfying. I wonder if it's consistently a more satisfying um, scenario for people if they see something uh, on screen and then out of excitement read the content. Because see, see, like versus the other way around. <laughs> see, that probably doesn't happen very often. It doesn't, because, but I'm, because there's more, you need more investment for comics. Is it easier for somebody to go into a movie, pay eight dollars to watch it on screen, right, or to spend twenty dollars every month to follow a character? Do you know what I'm saying? Because, like, so, for instance, mm-hmm. for instance, Jurassic Park and No Country for Old Men, mm-hmm. right? Like, I read both books oh, and Clockwork Orange after seeing the films. From excitement. Now, granted, these are single books. These aren't like I've, vast, vast franchises like mm-hmm. something like Marvel or DC. It didn't take much for me, but I will say that if I read, let's just say, No Country for Old Men and then watched the film, you'd have more to say yeah. about yeah, Yeah. Maybe, or maybe you wouldn't have liked it. it so right. I, I've only done that one time, which was for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy which is one of the funniest movies I've ever watched. I can't stand that movie, but okay. 
movie. Well, I also watched it when I was younger, so that I don't movie, know. That I don't know garbage. how I'd feel about it now. Just kidding. But, but uh, I loved it, and I read the book. Wait till the break, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually I like the movie a lot more than the book in that case. But that's my only experience with like diving deeper after okay. seeing the movie. This is it. It doesn't seem like it'd be a common thing to do. I don't think so. It wouldn't. It seems practical um, because you you generally would need if you're not into reading, right? I think a motivation like satisfaction from a film would be a great way to get people to turn back to books, but no, I'm saying if anything, right? Zero yes. versus something. Yes. Um that's that's the idea. That's what they want. But um I feel like I mean maybe it's just me being, I don't know, pessimistic or something, but I feel like these movies are giving people reasons not to read comics because they don't have to anymore. And spark notes. So yeah. You get the same satisfaction. It's cheap. But it also exposes people to it that would otherwise never read it. True. The and then there's that. Accessibility. But I think it does so much more. As far as audience building, it builds much more than it takes away. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of people, even like me, I don't think I'd ever really invest the time in the comics because I just don't True. think I have it. But the movies are like, you know, standalone pieces. Uh, that I can just watch and spend you know, two hours, two and a half hours, you know, maybe three if I'm going to the movies. Uh, and it's just, that's it. You know, it's real quick. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, even like the TV show, that's more investment. Like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I fucking love Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm caught up. Such a good show. Um, I have not finished the current season. I'm, mm. I'm only, uh, um, I'm only a few episodes into it. We'll get back to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it started out pretty strong. Actually, this one for me did not start out as strong as the last two. It didn't. Because uh, it's like, I literally came into it and I'm like, what just happened? Like, I had so many questions. And even like three episodes in, I still have so many questions. The thing about this season is they spent their time. I don't think they knew what they wanted to do with the show. Like they were at a crossroads. So they made this season as maybe a stopping point to well, the shield as a whole. Well, they have two. So they know they have this one and the next one. Yeah, now they do. No, they knew before when they started writing this season. Did they though? Yeah. Because it was renewed for two seasons. Okay. Uh, so they knew they had two seasons to tell a story. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with it because I haven't finished this one yet. But yeah. uh, in the past, I think they ended like the last season, they ended it not knowing if they were going to get another one. Okay. But this time they're like, we know we're getting two. So the way they wrote it, I think was different versus in the past ones, I think both with four season four and five, I don't think they knew if they were going to get rated or not. Are you watching any of the other shows? Any other Marvel shows? I mean, I saw some of the Netflix stuff early on, but okay. once Luke Cage season two came out, I started that and it was just boring as fuck. Okay. Cool. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't watch it. Uh -huh. And then, I want to see Jessica Jones because I think that one I will actually like. Jessica Jones is cool. Because season two of that was really good. Uh, so season three, I think I'd probably like. Um, same with um, what the, the blind guy. What is his name again? Daredevil? Yeah. You're disrespectful, man. <laughs> You're disrespectful as hell. I'm just letting you know. I know. That's the one person you should I know. know. I'm I'm a I'm an MCU pleb. <laughs> That's his talent. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would tell Being you, blind. Agents of Shield, <laughs> is pretty good. Um, I've seen all of it. Like as yeah. you yeah. listeners know, I'm a fan. Uh -huh. But I've seen all of it. Um, period. And I would say, you're not missing anything with Runaways. Cloak and Dagger is really good. I watched a little bit of Runaways, okay. but I do, I could just. I couldn't really get into it. And that's okay. Yeah. Cloak and Dagger is cold. <laughs> Cloak and Dagger. Cloak and Dagger is really that's good. That's with... Um, it's better than it should agents. be. It's the agents, right? Yeah. You know, I should watch that because I really like their characters on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Wait, what are you talking about? Isn't Cloak and Dagger the... No. Cloak and Dagger is with the, uh, the two kids. The one with like the, uh, the shadow powers and the other one has like the light powers. The fuck? Cloak and Dagger. Oh, okay. Never yeah. mind then. I, I must what be thinking of something that? else. I want to say there was a a spin-off series with um the two agents, the um Adrian Palicki's character and the other guy. I don't remember his name. I don't know what you're from talking. Shield. Uh mm. the like ex exes 
that clearly are still into each other. They're both spies. Oh, with Mockingbird and Hunter? Yes. That wasn't a show, was it? I thought they canceled it. They didn't that didn't happen. Oh, okay. It didn't happen. It but didn't happen. I would have watched it. Yeah, I would have definitely watched it. Fun fact for you guys, Mockingbird, that character is actually Hawkeye's wife in the comics. What? Keep it going. <laughs> of course. Keep it going. Of course. <laughs> It's Hawkeye's wife. The fucking comics, man. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, they Mock- they would do that. Yeah, it's Mockingbird. It's his black canary. Hawkeye is green arrow. Mockingbird is black canary. Okay. There you go. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, Cloak and Dagger's good. Um some of the Netflix stuff is good. You know, Daredevil's good. I've seen all of it. Iron Fist is horrible. Much Iron to my Fist, dismay. I, so the season one, I really got into it initially. Okay. Like it really hooked me after the first like two, three, and then it just kind of fell off towards the end. No, it jumped off. <laughs> Sorry, it jumped off a cliff and committed off. suicide. Yes, off it like is like, why am I alive? Yeah, what, uh, what, <laughs> what's my purpose? And just fell into a turbine or something. Just, and honestly, the like, that's what happened. <laughs> the the defenders was kind of the same way for me too. Defenders is more fun it, than Iron Fist, it, but it's you know, not, it definitely it, was more fun. But defenders like instantly hooked me okay and then like towards the end i was like okay i just kind of want to finish this. what 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 killed it for you i would say it's the villains for me what uh, killed it for you yeah i mean shit. the pro- problem is i don't even remember it that well at this point which it's, should should give you an idea of just how it's impactful fine. it was, it was, it was fine. Story. It was um, uh, but the first the first half i'd remember it loving like i was really into it and then it just it just like didn't materialize on the back end and okay. honestly, I still I couldn't like recount the first half. I just remember really liking it. That's fine. Remember how it made you feel, not necessarily what was happening. Exactly. Okay. Um, what else is out? That's pretty much it. Agent Carter ended. That was cool. I never saw that. Agent one. Agent Carter was pretty good. Uh, uh, Crystal, it was really solid. Yeah. So at the end of uh, Endgame, well, remember the flashback with um when Tony went. Back in time, met yeah. up with his dad, right? Yeah. The guy that opened the door, mm-hmm. that was Jarvis. He was in Agents of Car- Agent Carter. Yeah, yeah. That's why it was a big deal for everybody. No, I, caught, I caught it was Jarvis. The voice the, is, is, you know, unmistakable. Because yeah. it's the first time where something from the TV was in the movies, not the other way around. You know? Oh, right? okay. Like, that, yeah, like that's okay. never happened. Like, that's pretty cool. It's it's easy for the t- um, TV shows to recount stuff in movies but the movies never acknowledge the TV shows like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing with it makes Agents sense. Of I'm Shield just saying. Is, I think Marvel expected Agents of Shield to do really well, but like they didn't realize that the audience was like, we're expecting you to like cameo Thor, you know, yeah. or something crazy like that. The, it's know? all connected. Thing. Like literally bring in a character from the movies to connect them physically. Okay. Right. But not just like a side character, but like a main character. Nick Fury was in it. That's true. That's but that's it. That's the closest yeah, that's they only, got. Yeah. And even then, Nick Fury is he really a main? He's a main character in Phase One, but after that, true, not really. Mm-hmm. So it's. I, I mean, I think that's Alex why. Alex over there, like, what the heck? No, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I think that's why it didn't do as well as they initially anticipated. Obviously, eventually, it found its audience and it's been pretty stable, which is why they've gotten seven seasons, including the current one and the next one. Mm-hmm. Um. And they just learned to tell a story by themselves. True. Which, to their credit, they're really, really That's good. good at it. That's good, yeah. But like you said, I like I like when everything's connected. You know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is probably the one show out of all of them that have came out, the Jason shows, that should be the most connected to the movies. It should be. Definitely. Yeah. So. And then they just dissolve S.H.I.E.L.D. And... I know. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. Okay. Kind of a random question for both of you. All right, go for it. Little, little on a tangent, somewhat relevant. So, both of you have seen Captain America. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, would you prefer the Super Soldier Serum to augment your height, or just your physio- physiology in general, as seen in the movie? Um, so if you could, would you want the serum to just make you taller or would you want all of the other attributes that come with the serum? Easy. All of the other attributes. Yeah. You? Yeah. You too? But I mean, if I was five, four, I might have a different question or my different answer. No, you wouldn't because what's the cutoff you think for the, for the populace? 
I don't, I mean, to me, if you're, if you're pretty short, let's just say five, four for a dude, it's pretty short and you're like jacked. It just looks a little weird. True. Me. You haven't really solved the problem. Yeah. Mm. It's like, and, and this isn't my question. This is just leading up to the question. So, okay. So what if I told you that regardless of the form for the serum? So if you want okay. the height, you can get form A if you want okay. the ladder. Right? Okay. So you've got a dosage dependent regimen for either one. Okay. And with each regimen of choice, depending on if you want the height or just the physical attributes, yeah, physical attributes, you will have a predisposition for physical repercussions. It's not certain. It's dependent on genetics and it's dosage dependent. So maybe a shaving lifespan, maybe something as frivolous as slight hair loss, acne, mood swings, right? But it's dosage dependent. Okay. And we'll say that to give you kind of like a um, a window to work with, if you don't take anything, you're fine, right? If you take the full dose, that will be based clinically on who you are, okay. right? Given your, you know, given your physiology, you might die in your early 50s, we'll say. Would you still be inclined to take it? So you're asking me how and do I how feel so? about taking steroids? That's the question. <laughs> and why? And why? Can, and why can we? I don't. Pres- think, I don't why, think I would do it. Why can we present it the way we can on TV when it already well, exists? Well, steroids in steroids have adverse effects. The serum is fictional, and thus more or less perfect. So it's not presented as a steroid because it doesn't have the adverse effects of steroids. Um, do you do you think we would? And no, make I wouldn't Cap- take it. Make, make Captain America a bad guy. That adverse effects. Depending on what he was using is a. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Mm, no, because you you then you're thinking of does he take it because he's depends greedy. on why he takes it. Yeah, because it would be like it would be perceived more as like a greed. You know, if if you know right. there's going to be it's some perfect, side right? Effects. So if it's perfect, and so. <clears throat> there's no there's no question about the application or the intent to take it, right? Okay, but now if you have something on the line, there's actually more at stake. It's actually a more serious decision. I'm more interested in why one would take it, right? Well, my question to you is, do you think it's unethical to take physiologically changing substances in general? No. So if something could change your height with some kind of ill effect, no. I don't think it's unethical. I just think it's stupid. You think it's stupid? Yeah. It's um depends what we're doing with it. It depends on what, what it does to you. Captain America, for example, if he took the serum, if he had an opportunity to help people and he knew this serum might hurt himself. Hurt himself, there's a good chance he'd probably still take, take it. Take it. Um if he wants it just to be stronger. Yeah, I think it, it mm. says it says a lot about your character if you decide to take it. And why you and take why it. You take why it. you take it. Why so if you're just like a regular person, you decide to take it because you want, you know, to be stronger. And That's literally why all that shit. Erskine gave him the serum. Because he's a good man and not a perfect soldier. Yeah. There's, there's, so there's, it, okay. I, it would be down to like, I might not be friends with a person mm-hmm. over that decision because it would illuminate me about their character. But like, I don't think it's unethical. Do and I don't think you shouldn't be allowed to do it. Do you think? Do you think the average pro athlete's character is flawed by nature? Then, no, because they're competing for something. That's the difference. Athletes are athletes are competing with other people to be better. Then yeah. there's a pool. Yeah, if, if I want to be better for myself, that's one thing. If I want to be better to beat you, it's not it's, fair. If if it's if there's real stakes behind it, it's a mm. different story. Yeah. If you're just doing it for you or for like what you think it'll do to your image or like what you think it'll do for your friends or whatever. That's one thing. But if you're competing in something that has actual stakes, people actually care about that you might, you know, there's like maybe money attached to it or fame or audience, then that's a totally different story. Well, now you have, you know, the frivolous aspect of things like steroids, physical augmentation through surgeries, et cetera, as a very, very 
financially lucrative means to a career. Yeah, so like the, av- the average girl can go and get X and Y surgery, take X and Y drug and make a reasonable living. And is sh- this girl's character flawed? I should have known Maybe. you'd take a conversation about the MCU and turn it into a conversation about Instagram. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag public figure. Yeah. Hashtag for, detox tea. For, for those, Hashtag don't they all. For those people who are listening who don't know Alex very well, this is a subject he has a lot of passionate opinions about. We'll call it clout. <laughs> for the masses. For the masses. Uh. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's a good, you, you that's need to, a good you point need to draw the line because it sounds like character and income are now intertwined. This is why I don't tell people how much I make. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good point that would Instagram count as like a sports competition. That's that's ultimately what you're asking. Yeah, is, because are those equivalent especially in a world now too, where if your income is dependent on any kind of transparent crowd funded venture even something like instagram where your pop your popularity your influence drives your living you are an image to other people you you are accountable for other people at the same time you are able to touch other people in positive and negative ways someone that maybe pursued um, a career in Instagram, let's just say, for the most selfish of reasons, could still have a means to justify how they positively influenced thousands of people. On the same note, you could also say this person had quite a bit of negative uh, influence on the youth, you know, because of body image disorders or all kinds, whatever you want to make the argument. What I'm saying is you, you both are enabling people to pursue something if they can justify it through making a living it sounds like versus not i just want to like understand like where you guys are at well i just i I want to get to the core question which is is instagram the equivalent of a sporting event or sporting uh well why sport why 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 are why is it more appropriate for sports well because sports okay instagram implies a bias i think you look good that can change in a sporting event i can't think you run fast you either run faster or you don't true but but at the same time there's more relatability to what you see on instagram than sports well so. there's also there's the side that like we're saying it would be unethical to take this kind of stuff for sporting events partially because there's money on the line true so in that sense, there is a pretty direct correlation to something like Instagram because if you take something like that, potentially there is money on the line. Um, Another reason I'm bringing this up too. So the question really is, is money the differentiating factor or is it something else? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this too. Also, when it comes to things like sports, if you look at it retrospectively, it's like, look, you've got pros that are pros because of talent and drive and they're taking the secret sauce to just give themselves an edge over each other. Yeah, that's fine. And that's dandy. But in reality, there's a spectrum where you have the 0.01% of gifted people that would be top tier pros without substance abuse. And they just so happen to take it. It could even be modest. It doesn't matter. Then you have people on the other end who are above average and respond very, very well to these illicit performance enhancing substances because they want to be top tier. You understand? So, so you look at it in retrospect and you're like, look, look, I see this athlete on TV. This guy is amazing. And whether I whether I consciously register it or not, he influences my life. You know, he sports are his escapism because I want to be this kind of person. You know, I'm not going to like quit my job necessarily and pursue sports, but part of me kind of wishes I was this guy, right? There is a spectrum of people within even athletics where you have those that are going to be pros, whether, whether they eat cheeseburgers every day uh, and only train, you know, 10 hours a week uh, because they are so gifted. I'm making an exaggeration. And then you have those who are 
in a position where they have to pretty much dedicate everything to their craft and take something like a performance enhancing drug to get to where they are. And then here's a deal. Someone who is on that side of the spectrum doesn't have the, the foresight to know if, if they drop everything in their life, make the sacrifices and even take something like a performance enhancing drug, which in re- retrospect, we're just going to, you know, eat up what we see on TV, which is the product of their hard work. We don't know if they're going to fill that shoe or that pair of shoes. You know what I'm saying? So like many, many athletes that we don't see on TV ruin their lives in pursuit of being that athlete you see on TV. And that includes not just, you know, putting schooling aside or quitting your job or right or making said sacrifice, but also taking drugs because the expectations from sports due to what we want, what we've been exposed to now is so high. You have people doing whatever it takes to be those athletes that we see on TV. Those athletes are not human, right? But those athletes are also not said athletes just on one end of the spectrum. There are people that are doing whatever it takes, taking whatever it takes, right? So I'm also saying that on the one hand, yeah, Instagram clearly has a negative way of propagating body image issues. What I'm also saying is that athletics, due to like what we expect now, has a negative influence on mitig- or seemingly mitigating the risk of throwing away your life and putting everything into something, including one's health, to pursue what seems to be like a dream, like a dream life. Like I would love to be in a pro athlete, in my opinion, right? On paper, it sounds fantastic. I don't know what the cutoff line is between whether I can make it to that with X and Y sacrifices, including substance abuse or not, right? Let's just say I'm not LeBron James, but I'm someone with some marginal gap. And I don't know if said drugs are going to fill that gap. I might take that risk. Okay. But you have to also recognize that, right? That's what I'm saying. So like, this isn't a super soldier serum where you're guaranteed to fill the gap and you're guaranteed to not have health repercussions. Do you know what I'm saying? But because it's sports, and we see the we see the positive byproduct. People aren't having like health repercussions on TV. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not seeing all of that. You're not seeing people like quit their jobs, like not spend time with their family, not spend time with their friends, you know, not care about school, take drugs. You don't see that stuff. And I'm I'm making a I'm not making like a huge deal out of it, but it's just kind of an interesting thing how perspective really plays a part. If you are taking something that that closes the gap in like sports or in in like in competitive nature and stuff like that um then it's not necessarily a good thing now you're saying a lot of a lot of these people we may not know that they're doing it but they're doing it because they need to fill a gap where they think they do you know whatever um but i will go out of limb and say that this is kind of backtracking, but you're talking about Cap and stuff like that and Super Soldier Serum. His mean, I mean, his reasons for taking this matter. See, these sports, these Instagram models and everything, they're still very selfish. Yeah. And, and granted, remember, doing- remember too, you and I are 28. Yes. There is an age restriction gate for social media that just requires answering yes being 18 and over, right? Most of the, excuse me, a large portion of social media users may be between the ages of 15 to 20. We'll say, we'll say maybe even younger than 18. It doesn't really matter what the cutoff is. I'm just giving an example. These, or this audience may not have the maturity to understand repercussions, but they see something like Captain America on TV. Now, what I'm saying is that young athletes have even less of an understanding of whether or not it's worth pursuing said craft. So you're saying regardless of Captain America's like reasons for doing what he did, he could still have a negative impact on the people that see him. Well, well, Captain America is on TV. Yes. We have that. It's distilled. It's in sports because there's no negative. I was just trying to show that there's no negative repercussion. in sports. You see, I I could, I could buy it. And people love it. Like you're there. Athletes are like doing things for a cause. When you ask people, 
they're not doing it for the tens of millions of dollars. They're doing it for a cause, for competition, right? Mm-hmm. That's Captain America. For, it's distilled for my home it's, city. Yeah, it's, it's distilled and it's bullshit. But you don't see everything else. Like You don't see the high schoolers are taking drugs because they want to be that guy on TV, right? And like they don't make it to the college they want to make it to. And they you're don't, assuming and, that everybody... You're assuming that everybody knows how why Captain America is the way he is too. Like he could be nobody knows why, but they know he's stronger than everybody. You know, like um if people know, oh yeah, through this serum, this, this, and that, he became the way he is. That's one thing. If they just Captain America just shows up and it's like, oh, I'm assuming I can't be like Captain America because he's in a whole different bracket. You know, he's four or five brackets ahead of me. And that's something we have to understand. Like when we're talking about, you know, the youth or just the uninformed. Yes. People, young athletes, just people who don't quite understand what they're getting into, don't quite understand what it takes to be a pro athlete. Mm-hmm. This isn't really a niche. I mean, a lot of young athletes want to be athletes. Being a pro athlete is is a tight niche, but being an athlete in pursuit of being a pro athlete is much, much bigger, mm-hmm. right? College sports, high school sports, that's a big thing, right? Yeah. Um, And a lot of these young athletes go to the wayside because of, you know, what they pursue. And I think they should pursue what they pursue, but there's something called calculated risk, right? So, like, I'm just just curious what your guys' thoughts are. Well, I guess part of the equation is also that we are born inherently unequal in a lot of ways. And it's like, is it legal for someone who is born not a perfect athlete? Or is it ethical, not legal, but is it ethical for someone who's born not a perfect athlete to take these drugs to make themselves a perfect athlete, to level the playing field, so to speak? Right. Because theoretically, you could equate the difference in whether or not you take the drugs. It's kind of the same in the difference between whether or not your genes are perfect or not. Or not quite there, you know. It's it, it's unequal in both senses. The question is, one, is a man-made difference? The other is an inherent difference, and does that matter? Personally, I think so. Um, I mean, obviously, my inclination is to say that performance-enhancing drugs for any sort of competition, whether it's sports or even Instagram, the I mean, SAT, I'm taking that. Sure, yeah. sure, same, same thing. I don't think it's ethical. Like my inclination is that's not ethical because you're trying it's not just trying to push past your biological bounds if you will because you can push past your biological bounds by other means but even like as i say this it's like how can you really differentiate drugs from just like hard work or dedication or like it's all it's all kind of the same in the output i'm saying what that's you what do, I'm, and that's what you what do in your body that's is what you your business TV. And, but, and that's what I'm, and that's what I'm saying that that's what you see on Instagram. That's what you see on TV. Like you see the outcome, I think the, 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 the intent, the marginalization between talent and what it takes to fill said talent, each athlete or each Instagram model or public figures said agenda, like none of that matters when it comes to the outcome. Right. But at the same time, like we still digest it all as like a positive influence because we want to be said people. I mean, I think the problem comes when, especially when you have like drugs that have potential negative consequences, if someone takes them, it's pretty much like them putting a gun to someone else's head and saying, you have to take this to keep up with me. And you have to accept the risks that I was willing to accept, but maybe you're not willing to accept or you don't want to accept in order to just keep up and do what you want. That's right. That's right. And that's just 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 just, just, just raising the stakes. It's, It's called escalation. Yeah. Yeah. It's raising and it, it's raising the stakes in a way that allows those people who are willing to take the risk to take everyone hostage. And the the general audience doesn't actually take that into consideration. Yeah, and, and people don't realize it's, it's trivialized, yeah. right? So if you so on the one hand, if someone who just wants to look better is taking some kind of performance enhancing drug, that person is a bad person. And you can make the argument that, that person is, you know, vain or they're, you know, they're lazy. It doesn't matter. On the other hand, these athletes are taking a said substances and we praise them for the hard work and risk because we get to see this positive 
product, which is, which is escalated or heightened performance and talent on TV that we aspire to wanting to be a part of. That's what I'm saying. Um, but the thing is, this isn't just a realm for, you know, young adults and adults like this trickles down into teens and like young athletes. Yeah. It does affect aspiring to be a part of that world. So it's just an interesting thing. Anyway, we can switch topics too. I mean, we don't have to stick on this, but I, I was just curious what either of you thought about, about that realm. Yeah. That's uh there's really just a lot to impact there. Mm-hmm. All right, let's 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 okay. Let's move to something maybe a little less depressing. <laughs> is it depressing though, or is it just it just is? Know. It I, kind of is because I mean I'm like, depressed. There's no <laughs> there's no control. You know, like you, people are just gonna do this, and you can't. There's nothing we can realistically do about it's it. A, I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really one to generally go for the low hanging fruit, but I will say that this conversation could easily segue into kind of a mainstream nominal topic about like transgender athletes. What we just talked about and what Millen uh, concluded (laughs) essentially holds true for this. Like if you are a, you know, congenital male and you decide that you don't want to identify as a male or you just, you know, you come to the conclusion that you, that psychologically you do not identify as a male and you decide to pursue, um, surgery and, uh, hormonal therapy to make the transition. And then for some odd reason you decide, Hey, I want to pursue athletics. It should be known that that is not fair to women. It's not, yeah, you know, I Millen even, so. even Millen even mentioned that just genetics alone will never allow a play, an even playing field. We love yeah. the idea of an even playing field. People love that. People love the idea of equality. But a lot of times it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, right? It doesn't exist anywhere. It's yeah, not, I mean, it's the beauty and curse of being human where we are very, very different from one another. And there are billions of us. There is always a chance of a freak among us in any craft. Always a chance I, for a handful of them. For hundreds of them, for even thousands or tens of thousands, because there's so many of us, right? Um, it kind of bothers me when there's even an argument. Um, well, I mean, the problem, I think, is that ultimately, if you follow this logical path to its conclusion, you're basically saying, if you're transgender, you're not allowed to be in sports. It's kind of where you end up if you take it all the way to its logical conclusion. Right. Because... Unless, unless you're transgender without hormonal replacement and you compete in your biological gender, yeah, biological they can, sex. But that defeats the point but for yeah, a lot but of then, transgender. Then what's the point of being transgender? Yeah. Men and women. So that's the sticky part of that conversation. That's probably why people don't want to uh, you know, really address it in that sense is because if you hold that opinion, that's kind of where you're leading and that doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty bad. And like, it's well known that you know, with hormonal replacement or excuse me, hormonal, um, transitions, let's just say you're uh, a congenital female and you, or excuse me, a congenital male and you decide to transition to a female because you don't identify psychologically as uh, said male, uh, even with, uh, progesterone and estrogen, um, to drastically, reduce your free test levels physiologically you've had it's like it's the same thing as saying you have an a congenital woman who augmented her body for however many years of of her life prior to the transition with anabolic steroids Mm -hmm. so you could say let's just say i am an 18 year old man and i decided to transition to a woman and then after said transition i want to perform or i want to pursue athletics well i've technically been on anabolic steroids for 18 years should i be allowed to pursue sports that's a it's, yeah it's, 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 it's the it's, most similar thing it's also like um I, again it just comes back to like w- the world is not equal as much as we want it to be as much as we want the playing field to be it's just not it's not going to be and it's kind of one of those sacrifices. It's like sometimes you just get dealt a real shitty hand. 
What do you think about that concept and just education in general, Millen? What do you mean? Well, just the the prevalence of inequality through, I'd say, inaccessibility to good education like throughout the United States. Well, inaccessibility to education. The thing about what we're talking about, like the thing before, it's like people are inherently um, weaker or stronger and stuff like that. As far as... Uh, as far as education, demographics and everything set that up. You know what you can or can't learn. You might have to go through different avenues to do that. But to be completely honest, if you, I mean, I'm I'm in the uh, I'm in the corner that uh, certain demographics don't learn what they can because um, it's not within their best interest. Then other people's best interest for them to learn what they can. Mm -hmm. That you're, it's, that it's, you're it's somewhat well, it's that, best for the masses. That you're somewhat confined by your environment. I mean, at Educa the end of the day, education is in my opinion, something that's actually a lot more equal than physical performance. I think so much of our intelligence is not actually based on our genetics. Definitely. It's based 100%. on, it's based on our experiences. We're talking about access. We're not talking about potential intelligence, are we? Well, I think he's, I think he's getting at more of the genetic component. Oh, no, 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 no. no. So I agree with, I agree with you, Millen, um, regarding uh, intelligence being really pushed more by your life experiences, your environment. Um, and it's you know, and just overall development. Um, it's but the, like yeah, but it's the like Frank's seventy. Point, it's like seventy percent. But you like know, yeah, seventy eighty percent versus that that twenty thirty percent at the end might push you from smart to genius. But I, realistically, I think pretty much anyone could be smart. So we're talking about from a genetic. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't talking about genetics. I was talking about demographics. Yeah, demographics is, so, is yeah. different. I was cu I was curious about schooling just. How you try to provide better access to better education. I wanted to ask Millen because I think Millen cares quite a bit about this. That yeah. So when it comes to education, so much of it, certainly in America, so much of our inequality at that level is down to non-school factors, and you know, the, the first one is the fact that most school funding is based on property taxes. And so if you have schools in areas with low property value, they have low property taxes, they have, they have less books, money, you know, they've not just old books, but they have less experienced teachers. They have, uh, facilities that are falling apart and sometimes, and it's, it can be hard to learn if you're in like a rickety old building, you know, mm -hmm. it's distracting. So that's like where you start just on the education level that that sets up an education and a quality difference. But the real, the real biggest difference is the uh, parental poverty levels between different populations, because the biggest factor in a kid's education is their parents involvement. The other six to eight hours of the day. Yeah. Essentially it's well, it's more than that even. Well, aside from sleep, aside right? from sleep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So, what happens at home matters so much more. Even if the school quality stays the same, if you just cut down poverty levels in those areas, school uh, uh, attainment rates would go up. That's not just a, that's not just an education thing. That's also like overall health and wellness too. Yeah, it's easy I mean, to, it, it affects it's easy everything. To, it's easy to deal with your like your body in a positive way when you know where you're going to eat. Yeah. Well, you oh, know yeah. if you're going to eat. You know, um, every all your other uh, what's the what's the um, hierarchy of needs? Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow. Yeah, Maslow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that. It's yeah, like food and water, shelter. Yeah. It's easy. To, it's easy. To Social. Get, when your basic needs are met, it's easy to deal with everything else. Exactly. Oh, yeah, well, de definitely. It's, if you're it's not, not just easy. It's when your basic needs are not met, you're not able to deal with everything yes. else. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You just have like a like a limited amount of RAM. And when it's dedicated to said needs, I mean, you're limited, you're stifled. The same thing, like if you're not financially, if you're not financially stable as an adult, or if you're living paycheck to paycheck, it's very difficult to remove that stressor from your mind at any point of the day or week and start being creative. Your, your, your guilt, your, you know, the urgency and all things considered are not going to allow that. The overall yeah. anxiety is like, look, what are you doing with your time? The opportunity cost is to get out of set burden. That's cyclical. That's not going to resolve itself, right? I think the same thing goes for you know, children who have subpar upbringings and it's not even their choice. 
they don't, I mean, they're not going to know any better. It's, I think it's difficult when said needs are, are set needs are not provided. I mean, I, for one, believe that, that there's a heavy amount of inequality in, in upbringing alone. And that is seen in demographics, as you both mentioned. And it's kind of troublesome because I don't know what you do externally to resolve that. You can't just change the way parents operate. You can't, you well, can't. The only, the only real control you have at a macro level is just adjusting poverty levels. Yeah. yeah. That's really all you got. Money is a big, a big thing. Yeah. So uh, if you can solve the money issue for those populations that will over time trickle into a whole bunch of other benefits, you know, it's easy for a mother or a, or a father to like not, uh, to treat their kid a certain way when they know they're like, they know their checks coming in when they're comfortable and stuff like that. You know, uh, it provides emotional balance, mental balance, like when that money, like it's a trickle down effect. So I'm here for that. Yeah. Okay. You had a question. I had a question. <laughs> like way back. Did you? Did I? I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm tripping. I don't know. Hmm. I mean, we could circle circle back to to a little Marvel discussion at the very end here. I'll cap this off. This is this is your this is right. your world, Millie. I got another a very similar question then to the beginning. Infinity War or Endgame? Mm. Oh, this one's easy. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I already know. I think it's Infinity War for both of you guys, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, you gonna be different? Yeah, I'm gonna be different. You gonna be for, different? For me, it's Endgame, and I will say I think Infinity War. All right, child, is signing a, off. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Before you smack me in the face here. Um, <laughs> Infinity War is a better executed movie. But Endgame is just more fun for me to watch. That's the only reason why I like it more. Does that make it a better movie? To me, it does. Okay, so we're talking about, like, you're talking about, like, subject. Yeah. From a subjective standpoint. Because to me, enjoyment is the number one factor for whether or not I a feel movie you. is good. Uh, which is why, like, you know, you watch, like, John Wick. And it's going to have very varying opinions, right? I love John Wick. It's incredibly entertaining for me to watch. So I think it's a really great movie. Okay. Because it satisfies my top criteria. And okay. it satisfies a bunch of other ones too, but particularly it satisfies that one. Endgame for me, um, I thought Infinity War was a better movie too. Endgame did more to, to me emotionally. Easy. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Like the, <clears throat> I could, there's a number of scenes that can get anybody in tears in this movie, but. The scene that got me, and also you guys know I'm like a huge comic fan. So when I see, when I see things like that are like paying homage or characters that you don't see, but when I see team ups, that does it for me. That's that's it. Oh yeah. So I'm when, on your left, by the way. On <laughs> <laughs> Alex, everybody. <laughs> oh Jesus. That that hit me right here. Yeah. On your left scene, like. Uh -huh. everybody came out i'm like and this is gonna sound funny but the part that really got me when everybody started fighting because this is lord of the rings epic yeah that's how it felt this was like yeah lord of rings right? well the scale was on the it's same huge, level right so. i knew stuff was real for me when ant-man punched the leviathan straight in the jaw that's how i knew it was real okay i've never seen him throw a punch actually he did in the movies but he wasn't even all that this is crazy <laughs> so my life is complete. Hmm. These are the things I dream about because I'm so invested into all this. Yeah. You know, you know, I will, I will make a comment. Um, the battle in infinity war actually was more important to me than the battle. I knew what, and the reason why is because I didn't know what was going to come out from that battle. Oh, I kind of, I mean, I didn't know, but I kind of, what do you mean? Well, the way Endgame plays, the fact that it's called Endgame and we know like where it stands as an installment, like something's got to give. We I, we were no, all we were all saying. we were all halved, so to speak, after Infinity War. Mm -hmm. So there's that restoration. We know it's coming, right? We just don't know how it's coming. And the way it was presented to us, like, okay, this is a happy 
mm. resolution, yeah. right? Well, versus in Infinity War, you uh, technically you don't know if he's going to succeed, if Thanos is going to succeed. I don't think action. anyone actually really thought he was going to succeed. I didn't, at least, and oh. not that way. You know what? Okay, actually, now that I think about it, I don't think <laughs> I, I was on was my seat. Succeed. I was like on the edge of my seat That's with fair. Infinity War. It That's like fair. freaked me out with that battle. That's fair, and it just seemed more serious. It wasn't as yeah, there was definitely higher stakes. Way higher stakes. Like sure. if I were to rewatch them now, I mean, Endgame's battle scene is phenomenal. Like as a cinematic mm -hmm. spectacle, right? Yeah, there's only I only have one problem with it. What was it? Which is that Doctor Strange is just off in the corner, fucking throwing up a typhoon. And the funny thing about that, right? The funny thing about that, that is that. And the funny thing though. about that is that's another supporting detail about my criticism about that fight scene as a whole because that wouldn't happen in infinity war because of the stakes true do you understand what i'm saying that's a spillover because we know that they're gonna win that's like a, that's like a we can do that in an end game because we know what's gonna happen at the end that's how i felt it's like oh you've got someone as powerful as strange doing that so we know there's gonna be a positive end i know it's a weird way to look at it well but not like, only that Fate, the character, I mean, it's not fate, Dr. Fate, that's DC. Dr. Strange, he knew, he was he was pushing for that positive outcome too. So that's why he was off to the side. Not only we expected everything to be good, but he wanted everything to be good. So that's why he was off to well, the side. Well, that's a, that's a, yeah. yeah I mean, so he must have known then that if that water did actually spill over, they would have been fucked. Well, I think he wanted to stay out of the way so things could like happen the way they, they were supposed but, to happen. No, but they that. gave us an introspective way to retrospectively understand why he was doing nothing. Makes sense. That's how I thought. That's how I that's how I ran that scene. I'm like, oh, he's doing that because in Infinity War he saw all of the permutations of the future. Why would he do that? Oh, he must be doing that because must be a reason be, because it. that's this is the reason why they're going to win. But let's just say they didn't win in Endgame. Mm-hmm you wouldn't appreciate what Doctor Strange was doing unless they won because what he was doing was so ridiculous. True. You would just be like, this movie sucks. In so, Endgame. I'm talking about Endgame. Yeah. So they're telling you that they're going to win and they're explaining why. It's interesting. Do you under, I know, but that's I, how I, mean, I, that's how thought I thought because he saw moment, it. But, but he, it's because he saw all of the... I was waiting for him to, to do something as like a... as a justification for his role in infinity war going through all the permutations giving up the stone right like he had to he had to answer that in this movie he was answering that with something very very obscure that doesn't justify itself without that context so i'm like mm. oh they won and he had to do something right so i'm like oh, okay stakes are lower i think it's already this is how i thought i'm not saying this is how it is i'm not saying this is why it was done that's how i perceived it and in Infinity War, it's like, I, I don't know who's going to die. I don't know if they're going to win. It, I you actually, know in the end game, fair. they're going to win. I that's was fair. so surprised, actually, when Thanos won. I was, I just, fair. I just the thought. The masses, we, a lot of the people I who was, didn't read comics felt the exact same way. I, they're like, wait, yeah. what? I thought we were, I thought we were going to lose I was a bunch of people. And then it was, sorry, go yeah, on. I was disappointed. But that's something. Yeah. I mean, it's... No, that's fair. I think I felt more... In that sense, I felt more emotion with the ending with the ending of Infinity War. I also really... Because when I left the theater from Infinity War, I was like, what? I was like, what the fuck? There's not a single what, scene... What was that? To, but, you know, to play devil's advocate with myself, there's not a single scene in Infinity War that imprinted on me the same way as a number of scenes in Endgame. Yeah. Except for why is Gamora? Well, and yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. And, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Endgame like paid homage. It hits you in like like your heartstrings because of things that happened before. It was the buildup of 20, yeah. two, 23 movies that's, or something like that. That's Yeah, I think for me Infinity War maybe had the peak of emotion at the end of the movie. Definitely. But Endgame had many more roller coaster 80% of those peaks. And it like was, multiple times. It was yeah, in, yeah, at multiple and points. The reason I think part of the reason why I like it more is I actually think it's a more intricate story because you have a lot more variables going on and the way they like tie stuff in and the way you get 
like individual character arcs. So it's more personal. Your, main, yeah, game is more personal. For all of it your was main more characters. it was more character driven. Like well, I Infinity will say, Infinity War was. Well, I mean, you've said this. It's basically Thanos' it's movie. Thanos. It's Thanos, the yeah. movie, and there's a lot of throwaway of other characters. You're like, why would that character do this? Like, why would Star Wars actually? Like? Yeah, and it's I just think, like you're not paying homage to. The, I think the kind, heroes. Of, kind of like you, I did come in with the same expectation that in Infinity War. Thanos wasn't going to win, but he was going to kill a lot of people yeah. in the yeah. process. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause some damage. Yeah, and, like I figured we'd lose like a quarter of the Avengers just in battle. Yeah, that's what I thought that's too. That's what I thought. And I actually thought we are going to lose Captain in Infinity War. Yeah. I was like, I was like set on that. Yeah. But. See, that's funny because I'm the guy that read the Infinity Gauntlet before the movie, so I knew what was gonna happen. Yeah. Well, so, so I watched, again a different perspective. Yes, yeah. exactly. I I think it's very interesting. I'm glad you brought it up because, like, I already know what's gonna happen. I just want to see how. So going even to though do you it. already know what's gonna happen, you still like Infinity War more. And Infinity War is a, I said Infinity War is a better movie. I I, I like to differentiate the the two. Which like, one? Which one do you like? Do more? I like more? Yeah. Oof, I gotta watch Infinity War. I think I went back and watched Infinity War more than Endgame, so probably Infinity War. Well, I mean, Endgame has only been out for six months. I mean, still plenty of time to watch it. I'll probably end up seeing Endgame more than Infinity War. Ugh. I think they're tied at the moment. I think I've seen them both twice. I, mean, uh, I think I've seen Infinity War three fav- times and seen Endgame twice. Top three Marvel, top three DC. Speaking of Marvel, well, let's through. let's let's skip out on DC. For time. Yeah, top three DC is still like there, bottom there, there three. Is, there is no top three DC. <laughs> oh, Not yeah. the top of anything. Yeah, that's like, right. I think the, the... I completely forgot. I love you, DC. I'm just what I really, what I really meant is you. what I really the meant best? is rank Nolan's films. The I don't know why I said top three DC. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Oh. I, act, I, I actually was thinking that. Oh, I, see for, for me for me the, so disrespectful the best, alex the best movie in um in the dc universe is arrow season two okay so we're talking about are you talking about any property that has a dc character no. in it? are you talking about i'm, DC? I'm just fucking around because <laughs> i'm like what the hell and by the way that was pretty dope that was the only deathstroke right <laughs> yeah that was pretty clean. good deathstroke's cold that I'm was here, that was really good it. that that was the peak of that show for me i haven't I think I saw like some of season th- like maybe half of season three, but I just I'm caught up. Yeah, I and I did really like the Flash, but I just didn't. For some reason, I didn't keep watching it at the time, and I haven't gone back to like pick it up again. You'd probably like it. I'm sure I'd like it through I, season three. Yeah, maybe because I did. I actually did really like it when I started mm-hmm. watching it. So I think I would. I, I got to go back and watch it at some point. But top three MCU. That's fucking hard, man. Mm, are we not including him anymore in Endgame? Yeah, I'm sorry. Hold on. Top three Marvel movies. I almost feel like that we just... That includes X-Men. I feel like we probably... Oh, you're talking about Marvel? As, Marvel so everything. Marvel everything. Period. Ooh. Well, okay. I know like Logan's one of your top. <laughs> Logan's clean. Yeah. Yeah. Logan's got the best... Logan's good. Logan's got yeah. one of the best scenes I've ever seen... It's not, it's not top three. ...on film, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay. But, so... Shit. Okay, um, wait. Well, let's let's exclude Endgame and Infinity War. It's not even fair to compare them to. It's the not. Rest. So they're very. By the way, they're very close for I think most people. Anyway. Yeah. No, they're both they're both excellent movies, but it's like you really can't even compare like, them. the scale. Is and just it's ridiculous. And it, yeah. and it and it's not really. It's just taking up two slots. So yeah. Just 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 put them together. <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> regarding like we, we duration a, of the movies we, and just we I mean, want a more a more diverse yeah, list. Yeah. Is what okay. You're saying. Okay, I mean, I think I like tight. I like tight questions. Like, if you give me, if you give me like Marvel, but just the MCU, I could do that. If you do anything, that's let's, not do, let's do let's do just the MCU. That. Let's just do okay. just the MCU. Just, MCU. just keep it simple. Okay, Logan still won. <laughs> uh, for you, those of you that didn't see, I just oh my God. I just fist bumped to Alex. Yeah, he just <laughs> wiped out half the universe. <laughs> you know, I did. Half of DC is gone. Oh my God. <laughs> that leads to no one films. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Jesus. Um. Okay. So I think Spider Man is in my top three. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I really, really love really Spider-Man. into these Spider Man films. I just love Spider Man. P- 
period. Really quick. In a few sentences, why do you like Spider-Man? I mean, okay, so part of it's going to be Spider-Man was my first like serious introduction to superhero movies. Okay. With the Sam Raimi trilogy. Okay. So part of it's that. Okay. I also just, I don't know why, but his character, like the balance of his character's abilities and moves is just really cool. Guts Page Melon. Like, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen those films, I don't think. Yeah, he just said Raimi. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm right, not going to remember much. Of, I was, I was, this was a long time ago. Yeah, was, they're old. Young. You were yeah. super young. You were probably yeah. like yeah. seven? Just no, no, no. What was the first one? It was 2000. 2001? 2001. Yeah. What? Yes. And you were like six? No. Or you like six? It was either, two, it was either 2000 or 2001. Yeah. Or 2001. Yeah. Son of a bitch. You were like six. Four. And you still I would have been six if it was 2001. Can we cuss on this podcast? I mean, <laughs> I have. So. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, there's no advertisers, so well, god damn. Like, <laughs> I, mean, I gotta look this shit up. Impressive. <laughs> Back to oh, formula. Shit. <laughs> For anybody who's under like 22, it's 2002. Don't know what we're talking about. Close enough. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you I were like been, what? Seven, eight? I would have been seven. It came out in May, uh, 2002. So I would have just turned seven. Well, I, yeah so yeah it's been a while yeah wow wow mm. i actually also By i actually w- did like the amazing spider-man movies i know a lot of people didn't like them but i did like them. i i did not i thought they were i thought they were pretty good i i would not they're definitely not homecoming far from home for sure but they were pretty solid good solid like eight and a half movies for me fair enough um so yeah i i definitely put I definitely put Far From Home in my top three. Okay. Um, I'm tempted to put Ant Man in there. Okay. Because it's Ant Man. Ant Man is a solid, it's it's lighthearted a, film. It is such a well executed. I movie. appreciate the fact that you put Ant Man in this film because you know it's, most people wouldn't. It's not even like it, it's not even like it's just so well executed. Ant Man or Ant Man and the Wasp? Oh man! Are you grouping them together? You I were, no original original Ant Man is better, than, but I mean Ant Man Lost is really good too. But <laughs> it's a movie every week, yeah. No, but I, I mean Ant Man One might edge it out just because you get Luis doing his flashback thing more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Ant Man and the Wasp we only get to see it once, okay. And of course it's glorious, it's awesome, but he does it like three times in the first movie. True, that like it's a it it's out. a it's a well written. It's movie. just it's well written, well executed. The characters are really relatable, really fun to watch. I'm even going to go out on a limb and say, and this might sound ignorant, especially in the presence of Frank. I think Ant Man may be the best movie to watch in the MCU franchise, regardless of the context you may or may not have. The mm, so you're saying by itself, oh, best standalone? it's probably the best standalone. standalone. I'm not saying it's the best film because it's definitely not the best film, but uh, I think it, I think it's I think it's diluted the least, just because of how the movie plays out, what it focuses on, its execution, everything. Yeah, I, I could be wrong. I, this is for Frank to. Really I mean, you're wrong because of Iron Man one, but well, yeah, oh, <sighs> that's the other one. You know, that's that's <laughs> fair. Okay, wait. So other than that, <sighs> so now now that's for my number two, my my third one is in between <laughs> Iron Man one and the first Avengers. Okay. They're both I mean they're both really good. I've seen the first Avengers movie like five times. Well, the first Avengers meant so much because it was the first time it was ever done. Yeah. Like when when Hulk does his whole thing and hits the Leviathan and then they're all back to back. Yeah, the the, the yeah, circle the, panning the, or whatever. Well, yeah, that's like the single greatest shot, seriously, in the whole MCU. Like by far. And that that's literally like uh the Joss Whedon, I think, was the director. Was just channeling his inner Michael Bay for that shot. Mm. He does have an inner Michael Bay. Yeah, he's got some. He pulls it every now and again. Now again. Yeah. Maybe so okay, I, I'm gonna Bay go with too. my top. Not in not in order. Iron Man, Far From Home. <sighs> Son of a bitch. This is gonna be Ant Man or Avengers. Okay. Okay. What about you. I'm gonna say Ant Man. I'm just I gonna I'm gonna be a contrarian and just say Ant Man. Go ahead. Al. I'd say this is tough. I would say this is tough. 
we, we don't have all day. So I know this is difficult for me. I would say okay. Let's do Frank when, while you think about it. <laughs> Civil War, okay. Avengers, and Iron Man one, okay. An honorary mention would be a uh, be um Winter Soldier. The movie's amazing. It is a really good one. Like amazing. Mm-hmm. Like silly, stupid. Yeah. The problem is this: the MCU has so many like nine, nine and a half movies. It's very it's difficult, really to hard to them. pick a top yes. three. I would say Winter Soldier, Avengers, Iron Man, and honorary mention would be Civil War. Really, it's yeah. like Avengers a, is in your top three. Avengers is cold. It's fantastic. That's actually kind of surprising. It's, it's fantastic. I no, I mean it's an amazing movie, but I just wouldn't expect you to have it in your top three. I wouldn't I don't, think you would either. I don't know what I would actually No, like I would I would be told it would make complete sense if like I just asked a random stranger. I just would not expect you to have it. Well it's it's not it's not really what the movie stood for. Like, oh, this was, you know, a congregation of characters, you know, that we haven't seen for the first time. That didn't even matter to me that much. I actually had that that was actually a greater impact for me with Infinity War. But when it came to the first Avengers, the character dynamic between Stark and Banner was insane. And I've never seen a dynamic as well executed as that in any of the other films. Hmm. It's just my opinion. It was ridiculous. Like, so well done. Hmm. Just Interesting. Just opinion, though. Logan though. Okay. All right, just just to just to cap this off then. Okay. What's your favorite single non-battle scene in the MCU? I I mean I have one that comes to mind immediately, which is the scene after the party in Ultron when they're all just hanging out trying to lift the hammer. With the hammer. Yeah. Okay. I think that that might be one of my top ones. Mm. This is hard. Uh, this one's easy. <laughs> okay, what is it, Alex? So within just the MCU, it would be... Wait, wait, let me guess. You, you know it. Okay, it's the car ride in Homecoming where Keaton figures out that Peter is... That's actually it. second. Ah, fuck. No, it's the, it's the grenade cover. Oh, scene. okay. That's right. You, yeah. You've told me that yeah, before. That, ha- that hasn't, I mean, that hasn't changed. Uh-huh. And by the way, just honor you mentioned outside of the MCU, just regarding Marvel movies, my favorite scene is when Logan is confronted for the first time by his younger clone. That's like, that's like masterful writing. And right he just there. gets whooped. No, they just walk past each other. The first time they see each other. The clone just killed the family, and they walk, and he walks past Logan. Wait, he does? You have to watch it. It's such a. I mean, I tense, haven't seen it. You have to rewatch. It's just that. such a. Tense oh, I didn't scene. get what you were saying at first. I'm thinking you were talking about X twenty three. I'm like, yeah, his younger clone. Like, oh whatever. no, no, his actual. Like, you talking cl- about the, the the younger clone the that clone. they made the weapon? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know his his past. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> just walks right? past him, and he's like, yeah. It, the writing with, I mean, that movie. It just it doesn't get anyway. Go on. I'm All sorry. right, Frank, you're up. Ooh. Favorite scene. Damn. Non-battle scene. I got a few. An honorary mention for me is in Endgame when Thor talks to his mother. Fuck. All right. It's a good one. I loved that mm-hmm. because you can. He needed his mom, but he couldn't tell her anything. Like that was, that was heavy. And you can tell like the raw emotional like intelligence she had. She knew he needed it, but she didn't want to ask anything. I know you're not from here. I can't know, but just know I love you. I'm with that. Anyway, um. Top of my head. Oh, one more honorary mention is big man in suit of armor. Take all that. What are you? That was dope. Yeah. Cause like Tony was right. Um, <laughs> one of my, one of my favorites and you guys are going to think this is weird, but Iron Man one and Obadiah neutralizes Tony. Why? Oh, I love that. Like, I don't know. I just thought it was, I just thought he could act. He acted his ass off. Like he's just like, Oh, you think cause you have an idea it belongs to you. And he's just okay. talking to him and he, you know, and he's just talking to him and he just takes it out like one last golden egg to give. And he leaves him there to die. Uh, All right. Know. Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't hold it in the same high regard, but I see what you're saying. Okay. Maybe I just didn't think long enough. I, I don't know. I mean, I can appreciate, I can appreciate the, 
I can appreciate what you're, what you're getting at here. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Mm. All There's right. So many scenes. Well, I, I think we could probably do this for like 12 hours, but yeah. we've definitely hit uh, well past the we hour hit? mark. <laughs> I think it's a, where are we at? The, well, we started recording before the timeline. I think it's going to be about an hour and 20 roughly. Okay. Not uh, bad. Which was pretty solid. Pretty good opening. Okay. Any final thoughts, I guess? Um, so I'm sure if you want to add something at the very end, you can. This is your world. I mean, I kind of felt like that that discussion about a favorite scene is good final thought. Okay, I agree. personally, oh, give me one second. <laughs> Cut this out. I'm just curious. <laughs> Millie's world, everybody. I just wanted to hear it. Yeah, that was. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Millie's world. <laughs> All right, I'm going to cap that one off. All right, All right that was pretty good. It's good, All right, guys. All right, uh, till next week, I guess. Let's do it. See y'all. Thank you for listening to the Spy Fi After Dark podcast. If you enjoyed what you listened to, maybe consider rating or subscribing on whatever platform you're on. We'll be doing these on a weekly basis. And next week, I have my friend Corey on, and we'll probably discuss gaming, streaming, and probably some other things too. So, see you next week. Uh, or up, if it's not loud enough for you. If you're half deaf, because you've been going to concerts for half your life. Uh, otherwise, I bench like three, so I'm okay. All right. Soul's boy. Like, that doesn't count. I've been to like zero, so <laughs> we're good. I've been to like negative two. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I changing my answer? <laughs> <laughs> Just one downing each other. <laughs> All right, it's going to be great.